I've always been fascinated by boot sectors. They've always held an air of mystery for me. The very first sector of a floppy disk that granted your PC the power to load an operating system, or turn it into a brick if missing. Before I learned about the BIOS or assembly programming, the boot sector felt untouchable, full of cryptic incantations that brought life to the machine. These days I know better. The boot sector is just another piece of code. But I still find it special, even today, because it represents one of my favorite hacking challenges, being limited by space. Boot sectors cannot exceed 512 bytes of code, so the challenge, quite frankly, is making them do anything at all. And yet, people rise to the challenge. Some people have created boot sectors that don't load an operating system, but rather load a .com or .exe file directly. The demo scene has long enjoyed 256 byte competitions, most of which are trivial to modify to put into boot sectors. Some people have created entire games that fit into boot sectors, such as a reimagining of Donkey. Oscar Toledo wrote an entire chess program that fits into 356 bytes, and has even written some books on making boot sector games. All of those are cool, but they all have limited scopes, which makes programming a little easier. What about unlimited scopes? Could you fit an entire language that lets you code whatever you want, all in a boot sector? People have written Turing complete minimal languages that fit into boot sectors. Caesar Bloom's Sector Fourth, a limited scope fourth interpreter, comes to mind. But recently, another project was brought to my attention that crams a Lisp interpreter into a boot sector. It's called Sector Lisp, and it's been proven functionally complete because you can load a Lisp interpreter written in Lisp into this boot sector program, and it evaluates correctly. I think boot sectors are really neat. So today we're going to dive into the basics of a PC's floppy disk boot sector, what's inside a typical DOS boot sector, how you can get started writing your own, and how you can run it on vintage hardware. And just to make it fun, we'll do it by testing Sector Lisp on an original IBM PC. When IBM created the IBM PC, they needed a method to start the system from a floppy disk, so they wrote a very simple bootstrap loader that executes after the power on self-test. This bootstrap copies the first sector from the first drive into offset 7C00, then transfers control to what it just loaded. That's fairly straightforward, but what did we just load? What's inside a typical PC floppy disk boot sector, and what does it do? An MS-DOS floppy disk boot sector has four main sections the OEM name and BIOS parameter block, executable code, error messages, and a signature. The OEM name is exactly what it looks like, the name of the OS that formatted the floppy disk. The BIOS parameter block is a table that describes the format of the floppy disk, such as how many bytes are in each sector, the number of root directory entries, and what kind of floppy disk it is. For a full description of this area, see the links in this video's description. The executable code in a DOS boot sector has one function. Use the information in the BIOS parameter block to find the start of the operating system on the floppy disk, load it into memory, then pass control to it. The error messages warn the user if they inserted a diskette without an operating system and prompt them to insert a different disk. The signature is a special value in the last two bytes, hexadecimal 55 and AA, that most BIOSes, and MS-DOS itself, use as a magic number to determine if the entire sector was loaded correctly. If that signature isn't present, an error message is displayed. Throughout this video, you've heard me use the term boot sector instead of another name you might be familiar with, the master boot record. That's because they're not the same thing. Yes, the master boot record itself is a boot sector, but it's only installed on hard drives because it has a different structure. The master boot record gets rid of 64 bytes of code to make room for a hard drive's partition table. The partition table is used by DOS to divide a physical hard drive into multiple logical drives. Because a master boot record has less room for code, it chains to a secondary bootstrap called the volume boot record, which is what actually loads DOS. A description of the partition table and this chain loading process is outside the scope of this video, so I'll leave some links in the video's description if you'd like to know more. But now you know, floppy disks and hard drives have different boot sectors even if formatted by the same version of DOS. With this analysis, we now have enough information to start making our own boot sector. MS-DOS has a lot of messy data structures and code in its boot sector, but nothing says we have to honor that. In fact, boot sector assembly code only needs two things. First, an org directive. 
We know that all legacy BIOS code loads boot sectors at offset 7C00, so we need to tell the assembler that our code will start there too. This is done with an org directive with the starting offset, ensuring the assembler will generate offsets starting from this value. Next, we ensure our boot sector will have the magic signature of 55AA hex in the last two bytes. Modern assemblers, like NASM and FASM, have a way to specify locations as a math operation. Older assemblers, such as Turbo Assembler, which I'm using for this demonstration, need specific offsets instead. Whichever assembler you use, put the 2-byte signature at the 510-byte mark. And that's it! You can use up to the last two bytes of the sector for anything you like. Now, before you rush off to write your masterpiece, it's worth mentioning that debugging boot sectors can be a nightmare, because on most PCs you have no way to run a debugger during the boot sequence. But don't worry, with a few more lines of assembly, you can generate a .com program as well as a binary boot sector from the same source code, allowing testing and debugging your code in a DOS debugger. The basic idea is to have a directive that indicates if you are assembling for a .com file or a boot sector. Then, you can use conditional statements, such as if, to control what happens if that definition is active or not. For example, we need org 7C00 when assembling to a boot sector, but org 100 if assembling to a .com file. Directives can also be used to omit the hex magic signature when making a .com file, or maybe add an exit to DOS condition, like hitting a key. In this way, you can produce both .com files and boot sectors from the same source code. Now that you've assembled your boot sector into binary code, how do you actually boot it on vintage hardware? Most DOS versions come with a rudimentary debugger called, unsurprisingly, debug. In addition to debugging programs, debug also has the ability to read and write sectors on attached media. To write our boot sector, we copy our assembled boot sector binary code over to our vintage PC, then load it with debug. Debug loads it to offset 100 in the current code segment. To write it to the first sector on a floppy disk, we use the write command with the following arguments. For address, we use 100, which is where debug loaded our binary file. For drive, we use 0, which is the first floppy drive on the system. For the first sector, we use 0 for sector 0. And for the number, we use 1 to write out one sector's worth of data. Once the floppy drive light goes off, hit Ctrl-Alt-Delete to view your masterpiece. Now we can test something much more interesting, Sector Lisp. Full disclosure, I don't actually know how to program in Lisp. I grew up learning imperative and procedural languages like Pascal, C, and Assembler. To me, Lisp source code looks like complete gibberish. While the main inspiration for making this video was to see if Sector Lisp actually works, it was also so I could learn a little bit about Lisp. And what I learned was actually kind of interesting. Lisp is considered the second oldest high-level language, created in 1958. The only language older than that is fourth, and that's only by one year. A lot of classic language features can be traced all the way back to Lisp, such as recursion, tree data structures, dynamic typing, and higher order functions, the latter of which are cornerstones of modern languages like Python and JavaScript. Another crazy thing about Lisp is that a Lisp interpreter can be written in about 45 lines of Lisp code, which has prompted people to describe Lisp as the Maxwell's equations of software. I'll confess, some of that is over my head. So let's get back to Sector Lisp and cover what it is and what it isn't. It is a boot sector that allows you to enter Lisp expressions, which it then evaluates. To fit into a boot sector, it only evaluates the essential functions of the language. The authors describe it as an assembly version of the original Lisp meta-circular evaluator written by John McCarthy, the creator of Lisp. While Sector Lisp is a functional native interpreter, it's not entirely practical. For example, it can't load files, so I'll be testing it via the keyboard. It also doesn't implement traditionally included functions like list, push, append, and arithmetic functions. That said, Sector Lisp contains the primitives necessary to write all those functions from scratch. <laughs> 
hope this video has helped demystify boot sectors and the booting process. Even if you don't know any assembler at all, I encourage you to read the source code of all the boot sector games and languages mentioned in this video. The comments in the source code for these projects can be just as enlightening as the code itself. Hey, if you made it this far, I wanted to give you two little bits of trivia that I tried to work into the longer narrative, but just couldn't figure out a way to make it work in the in the story. Um, the first thing is that 7C00 offset. Uh, that offset is interesting because it answers a trivia question. How much RAM do you need in an IBM PC to load an operating system? Since the 7C00 loading address is hard-coded into the BIOS, and that's right near the 32K mark, the answer is 32K. Uh, if you have have only 16K in your IBM PC 5150, which was regrettably an option um, that they provided at launch, um, you can't load an operating system because there's no RAM where the boot sector would go. So I hope you like writing basic programs and saving them to cassette tape because that's all you're going to be able to do. Uh, the second thing is that, that um, at the end of the boot sector, that 55AA signature, uh, I very carefully in the video said that most BIOSes and MS-DOS look for that signature to see if the sector is loaded. And that's not because I didn't do my research, it's because I did do my research. The original IBM PC and AT BIOS revisions don't check for 55AA hex. They just run whatever is loaded. There's no validity checking at all. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think that Microsoft was the one who introduced that sort of signature. There's no like standard for boot sector code, as I hopefully illustrated in the video. You can put whatever you want in a boot sector. So that 55AA hex signature introduced by Microsoft didn't really make its way into the BIOSes uh, checking to see if a boot sector had loaded correctly until the latter half of the 1980s. So there you go. Uh, anyway, if you've made it this far, thanks very much uh, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope this was a valid entry to uh, DOS-Sember, which is, of course, the annual uh, making of videos about DOS and DOS-related subjects in the month of December. And uh, big thanks to my patrons, uh, of whom uh, have given me some nice advice and, of course, financial support. Uh, I'm shooting this actually on uh, better equipment that my patrons helped me get, so uh, once again, thanks very much. And uh, if you have any suggestions for future videos or something, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And uh, until next time, uh, happy DOS-sember. <laughs>